it's the barrier for entry is now you know so low that people can just log into a trading account and start trading without you know without having kind of you know a, a mental check have i got these blinkers on New people to the market have no idea what makes up the contract they're trading. Most of them just see it almost like a computer game, just, you know, a price. And that's it. They have no idea what the underlying is. People don't see it as a skill, like you say. They just see it as numbers on a screen in a bit of a game, it, which brings us straight to like one of the most crucial aspects of trading, which is journaling. Journaling is not writing down the number of trades you've done and your P&L. That's a very important lesson for, I think, a lot of new traders to understand, especially if they've found a, you know, they found an edge or a niche as soon as they've started trading. You know, happy days. You know, congratulations. You're off to a flyer. Do not sit on your laurels. Yeah. Yeah. And that and that ties back perfectly to journaling. This is why you should, and you know, you compound that edge by journaling. Welcome to the Alphamine podcast, where we seek to explore, examine and illuminate the mental, emotional and behavioural challenges of trading and investing. The Alphamine podcast is co-hosted by Stephen Goldstein and Mark Randall. Our guest today is Ryan Pacey. Ryan has been in and around markets for almost two decades. He has been a market maker, a day trader, a scalper and a prop trader. These days, he devotes his energy to providing a trading news service called Priapus IQ, which he describes as all killer, no filler news and commentary on all things markets and geopolitics, which provides a more slanted and edgy perspective on news and analysis, which impacts markets and which traders can use to help them improve their own decision making and idea generation. This service aims to differentiate itself from the standard news and information offerings which traders receive and which Ryan recognises is exactly what traders need as opposed to just headlines and data. In this interview, Ryan shares some deep thoughts and perspectives about a host of aspects of trading from his many years of experiences in the markets as a trader and around traders. Ryan feels passionate about the learning journey for traders and how so many people enter trading without the support and guidance that he and his colleagues receive from experienced traders who had been around him and were around him in the physical settings of trading room environments. As you will hear in this vibrant chat, Ryan holds some strong views and doesn't hold back from expressing them. We're pretty sure you're going to enjoy this. Stay right to the end on this one. Before we start, a few words about our sponsor, the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA, and their brilliant technical analysis home study course. The home study course is an online version of the full programme, which is taught at the London School of Economics. If you are keen to develop your technical analysis skills and take your knowledge and understanding of them to the very highest level, then this is the programme you should be considering. As one of the lecturers on the full programme, I am fully aware of the high quality of the home study course, which has been written in partnership with many leading figures from the world of technical analysis. And since the STA is a not-for-profit body with a history going back over 50 years, you can be certain and their only agenda is your education, development and growth. We are delighted to announce that the STA are offering a discount on the full cost of the Home Study Course and the Home Study Course and Diploma Programme to listeners of the Alpha Mind podcast. To find out more about the Home Study Course and how to get the exclusive Alpha Mind discount, visit the Alpha Mind blog page where you will find a link to the Home Study Course at the top of the page. Go to alphamindblog.blogspot.com or just Google Alpha Mind blog. Now, on with this week's podcast. Welcome to the latest edition of the uh, Alpha Mind podcast. We're delighted to have Ryan Paisley with us. Uh, Ryan was on the uh, transitioning period from the life floors that went into the world of electronics. He worked um, for the Kite Group and transitioned from uh, looking at plain old products to those that were there on the IPE and uh, Fed in love with commodities, which is something that resonates uh, an awful lot with me. His trading strategy shifted over time from a a scalper to a to a macro trader, looking at global themes. But all sorts of um, great value, I think, we're going to learn from Ryan's day and his journey. And um, his journey to date is with with his company Priapus IQ, uh, where he runs the morning ramble product. And I'm sure a bit later on in the podcast we can chat about that, but. Welcome, Ryan, to the show. Tell us a bit more about yourself. Good morning. Well, afternoon, yeah. Well, it depends where you're reading it from or listening to, I guess. Um, 
Yeah, so, well, you pretty much nailed it on the head there, uh, Mark. It's uh, I kind of started at Kite, um, which was run by some, some of the bigger locals from the life floor, um, like David Kite, as you know yourself. Um, and I was kind of like the first runner that they took on once they left the floor. So it's still very much the, the old pit mentality. But obviously now all the, the pit traders are in front of 14-inch four, old-style um, uh, screens which was a, a bit different from what we've got now with your 32-inch flat screens and whatnot. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was a great time to start, I think, because it was, like I say, it was in that transition period from like the mentality of being a local and, you know, like we've mentioned before, kind of, you know, you're watching the flow and all stuff like that. And then it migrates into, you know, looking at the screens. And, you know, it was, like I say, it was a great time to to start. I started at the very, very bottom, as in, you know, I think it probably took me a couple of months before I was trusted to get the coffees. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so you kind of, you picked it all up from, from the very early start, from the early days like that. And then eventually after two years, given a, a trading account, um, and I was basically told I could trade whatever I liked. And it was just as the IPE floor had been bought out by uh, the Intercontinental Exchange, ICE. And so that was rolling onto screen. So it was, it seemed like a good match for me because one, I've always been quite passionate about geopolitics. Um, so obviously the crew market and whatnot is a lot more kind of, you know, m- more involved with that kind of thing, as opposed to kind of your interest rate products that the life guys were trading. Um, but also it, it struck me as a good opportunity because we had that, another wave of floor traders coming to screens, which kind of leveled the playing field somewhat. So that was kind of, that was the market I focused on to begin with. Uh, well, for a good few years, trading outright spreads, different kind of styles in amongst that. Um, yeah. And then just kind of moved around from there. I've had kind of, you know, I've had my ups and downs of, of trading, which, you know, all of us have. Um, and now I've kind of put trading more on the back burner and slowly moving into more of kind of the market kind of commentary and analysis um, through my PIQ, uh, Prepus IQ product, which, uh, yeah, that's kind of, that's a very brief overview of my career so far. Okay, brilliant. brilliant. Tell us a bit more about Prepus IQ so, because I follow that on Twitter. Yeah, so and, the, uh, I, I, uh, you, you like a bit of humour in there as well, which is well, great. I think that's kind of, I do think that's kind of a remnant of, you know, the old, like the old boys that I used to work with, and that it was very like it, it wasn't very sterile. Let's put it that way. Like the HR departments <laughs> would have had a field day, um, <laughs> but it became. I just kind of when I was kind of s- slowing down my trading and focusing more on kind of getting as much information out there to the public because uh, I'm a big believer in. There is so much information out there and it is available if you know where to look. So to kind of put it in one place where everyone can kind of get the same information, I think it's very important. And it is something that I am quite passionate about. So I started up a dedicated market commentary analysis account, just just basically something to kill the time. Um, Obviously, that kind of started kicking off and realised that, hey, I can add a bit more value here which is when I started doing the the morning ramble, which is a very, a very kind of, um, you know, working man's, if you, I hate that phrase, but it's like a working man's morning primer. So it's, you know, it, it's written as I speak, which everyone knows is kind of, you know, you know, brass tacks kind of, I'll just put it out there, whatever I'm believing in that moment. Um, but it's also, you know, the overnight news, uh, what's what to look forward to during the day, you know, more importantly than not, things to ignore during the day. So you'll see on market calendars and stuff, so-and-so might be talking or whatever. And we know that, you know, that's just going to be noise in the background. So it's just trying to give traders just a very brief overview that, you know, what to expect, what's happened in the last 24 hours. Um, And it's gone really well. You know, I've got a mix from institutional brokers, um, uh, subscribers to also fairly new retail traders. It's kind of, you know, it's trying to catch as many people as possible. And, you know, just just tell it how it, as it is, really, because there's there's a lot of similar products out there that just get very technical very quickly, which, you know, I think it can be a bit paralysis by analysis, which I believe is a, something a lot of traders suffer from. Um, 
yes, so that's the ramble. And then quickly just moving, uh, I am actually about to launch a um, an information dashboard thing, which is kind of like tweet deck plus RSS feeds plus news and stuff like that, which is hopefully coming in the next month or two, which would be good. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. And, and, and it's, it's really interesting because, you know, when I go back to myself as a trader, and I'm sure you, it may have been part of the inspiration for you doing this from when you were a trader, the, the information that was really, really crucial was not the information that everyone else had, but those yeah. those little insights that no one else had. Um, but, but also, you, have, you do get the problem, that I, I think a lot of traders don't, well, especially guys that are quite new, don't realise that you can have some important information, but if you're the only one that knows it, it's pointless. A lot of people, you know, a lot of people get caught up trying to find stuff that no one else knows. But until everyone else knows it, it's worthless to the market. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, you know, you know, it's um, there was a trader who I worked with many years ago who used to tell me that was his style, that he would go in on new information that no one else had. But he would always be a little bit coy about it because he didn't know whether it was ever going to catch on or not. But, you well, know, this is it. particularly if it was contrarian, he loved it. And he always felt that if he was wrong, he could get out without too much pain because there was no yeah. no rush to because the exit. There's, yeah, there's, no, there's no news going the other way, so to speak. So yeah. they, it's one of those, you can get in on it. And as long as you're, I think that's it. If, if you're prepared to have faith in what you know that the market doesn't, and you can sit on it and you can, you know, be patient, be disciplined. It all comes down to discipline. If you can be disciplined and knowing that, hang on, I know this is right or whatever, then, yeah, it's a fantastic way to trade. But it's the people that you know, might hear some news first, or it could even be some news that pops up on the Reuters terminal or whatever, but just it's been missed by a lot of other people. And you get involved on on that piece of news, but because the market doesn't go in the in the first five seconds, they think, oh, God, it's, you know, it's irrelevant. I must get out. And then as soon as they get out and then obviously then it's published again on Bloomberg, say, like two minutes later. And then the market goes. You must have seen this all the time, Mark, in your job, in your work. Oh, my God, all the time. I mean, as you were talking there, it reminds me of the big short, you know, the you know, the sort of the. Yeah, actually, yeah. The observation of something that was uh, with, you know, real curiosity, you know, the, the discovery of something that was just so wrong and. It took time for the market to wake up, for it, and it woke up in such a shock that obviously his his position came came on board eventually. But the market was so offside and believing the other way for so long. Um, but I've seen it, yeah, certainly from the early days of, of my career. It was it was about understanding where there was value in in the edges. Um, the, the market wasn't just about the bid and offer and the size. It was about a lot more than that. But so many people yeah. that trade the market nowadays, all they all they think the market is is, you know, what 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 volumes up and down, you know, five ticks yeah. the current bid and offer, and that's their world. Um, and I think certainly the the concept of opening up your awareness to to the breadth of the market is almost your starting point, you know. And, yeah, uh, well, that's that's otherwise you can't put the blinkers on, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, I guess. Otherwise, you've got blinkers on, right? You got yeah, and 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 I think it. Um, I think experience opens up that awareness. I think yeah, you know, and also does the opposite. I think like starting as I did, like on a trading floor with you know what I think at, at that point when I first started, I think the, the main trading room at Kite must have had thirty, possibly even forty traders. Mm-hmm. You know it's impossible to be blinkered because you've got so many people looking at different things, different styles being traded, different products being traded. Everyone's got their own kind of edge while trying to develop an edge. Um, So from the very start in that environment, it's difficult to be blinkered. However, a new trader now, when they start, you know, they might be looking at one information screen and they might be just sitting there at home on their own. And it's, it's almost, it's the opposite. It's, it's almost their default is blinkered and it's very hard for them to kind of, you know, remove those blinkers and open up, which kind of it, you know, it's like what we've said before. It's, you know, it, it's the barrier for entry is now, you know, so low that people can just log into a trading account and start trading without, you know, without having kind of, you know, a, a mental check. Have I got these blinkers on? Yeah. And it's just an app. Their method of entry is, 
is often just some, I mean, not even a trading station, as we call it, a trading station. This is it. It's all like, you know, most not even on a laptop or anything. It's not on their mobile phone. It's the gamification of the trading, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's I like me and Steve have spoken about in the past. It's, yeah, when I start, when, like when I started, when, like when you started, when and many of like us older people started, yeah, you had to go through, you had to learn the market or else you were never given a trading account. You know, you had to just being there, just immersed in it all. You learn about, okay, well, the buns and the gilts, uh, you learn about what makes them move. You Then you learn about, you know, how the different kind of equities markets move, royal markets and whatnot. And yeah, okay, you, you didn't have to become an expert in them, but you knew the product makeup of them. You knew what the, yeah, even the little things like knowing what the tick size of like the FTSE was trading and all stuff like this, but now, where you can like, all the fractional shares and stuff, you have no idea. Which like new people to the market have no idea what makes up the contract they're trading. Most of them just see it almost like a computer game, just you know, a price, and that's it. They have no idea what the underlying. And I, I really do think that that's hugely detrimental to anyone starting. Well, it's you know, it, it's a, it's a skill, isn't it? I mean, trading is a skill that takes many many years to learn and develop. Yeah. And, you know, I, I do think there's a problem here for many people in that they don't realise what a skill it is. They think it's a game. And like a game, you can yeah. learn it in, you know, you practice a bit, you learn a few steps and within a few weeks or a few months, you're accomplished at it and skilled at it and, and you're off. Uh, and that's just, you know, and, and it's actually some of the feedback mechanism doesn't help that because you might carry on playing that game really well for six, nine months, because that is the game for the market at that point in time. Um, I think we've yeah. had that over the last year. You know, anyone who started in the last year thinks you just buy cheap, buy the dip. <laughs> so well, to speak. It's, funny enough, it, it's the same. It's, there's obviously, we've all seen a massive influx of like the crypto traders now moving into FX. Now, for the crypto traders, all they were doing for a couple of years was just buying everything. Now, it didn't matter what the coin was. They were just buying it and it was going up and they've made money. You know, you know, fair, fair play to them. But what they're doing now is they're now, a lot of them are now moving into, say, equity stocks or whatever. And just thinking, well, you know, it's gone up for the last year and a half, two years. You know, I'm going to buy it. Or, you know, it, it's, it was especially with like the FX and stuff. You see a lot of them make a lot of money in crypto, move over to, you know, vanilla products. But bringing that mindset of crypto with them not realizing that hang on it's a different game i've got to relearn some skills or learn some completely new skills whatever and they end up just doing their ass and it's yeah it it's yeah it's something that yeah is indicative of the fact that people don't see it as a skill like you say they just see it as numbers on a screen in a bit of a game yeah and, and do you know what you, you you said something earlier on which really stuck out with me um, it was when you said you, you got the coffee in the office. That's yeah. how you used to learn in the early days. You'd sit yeah, there, everyone, you know, you wrote the numbers on the board. Maybe you checked their trades at the end of the day. You you did their positions. You got the coffees. You got the, you took a lot of crap, to be honest. You know oh, that? yeah. <laughs> I'm sure yeah. we've all got stories of the crap we all took when oh, we first God. started. <laughs> you were the butt of it jokes. You know, it was, it was a toughening yeah. up process as well. Oh, well, like my first day in the office, I was, yeah, I was already told, you know, it's not a suit kind of place, but just smart casual. So I wore, I remember I wore these brown brogues, smart jeans and a shirt. I think I was in the office for about half an hour before I was put up on one of the big rows of desks and made to tap dance down the whole length. <laughs> of the and, and this is my like, the first half hour of working there. And I was almost in tears and I was like, oh my God. Yeah. But yeah, wouldn't trade it for the world. No, 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 no. But that, that's what it was. I mean, we'd probably get, we'd probably have the whole business put up in front of HR for shaming you. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> it, yeah well, f- thankfully, HR didn't exist at all. And, you know, it's like, I wouldn't say bullying, but it was on the verge of, it could be, you know, it could be interpreted as bullying. But, you know, like you say, it, it toughened you up. But also, you know, if you gave it back as well, it was, you know, you, you gained respect that way and, it wasn't all bad, let's be honest. But like you say, in terms of getting the coffees, I'd get the coffees for, say, like Adam Nash, our friend, who's he's been on the show as well, hasn't he? Adam, Adam yeah, yeah. Yeah. I remember like, I used to get his coffee and whatnot. And then 
give it to him. And then you'd sit down with the, if he was quiet or whatever, you'd sit down and he would just point out a few things. And you do that for two, two and a half years with, you know, 20 different traders. That's where you pick stuff up. And it's, you know, it gives you such a good grounding in like lots of markets and also just the right kind of mentality to push forward. When we started the life market uh, back in, SEP 82, we had a degree of training beforehand, but we didn't have a clue what it would suddenly be like on day one. And uh, because most people in, in that camp didn't, the world didn't exist. There was no video to watch or anything. It was just, you know, we had a little bit of uh, training. Um, but uh, until that starting point where we started to realize that actually, you know, we had to start to support each other as well. You know, so a lot of the locals started to become um, flow agents for some of the bigger houses because they had a they, they had a better point in the pit and they were just you know there all day. But that camaraderie was um, was super important, and I always remember David David Kite actually stand, standing out because he he took control of a, a niche. Really, he was he, he was making spread. Spread prices on, on pretty much everything, which when you go into the world of negative spreads can be quite, quite. Yeah. Cool. But um, he he'd spent time and had the the sort of that curious, calm nature to almost align his personality to a product, and yeah. his and his reputation built upon the fact that he was always there to make for, for, for almost any size, you know, um, spread prices in anything you fancy. And I, I sort of, sort of certainly paid attention to the fact that, um, that, that that was very interesting to be, to be able to not just have this awareness of the market, but also to have a bit of a niche as well. Yeah. And, and yeah. Which, like you say, he did carve that out for himself. Because well, funny enough, like, well, obviously knowing David for years as I did, well, do. Um, yeah, you're, you're not the first person to mention, you know, the, the reason that he became respected and, you know, and trusted within the life market. And that was because he did carve out this little niche for himself. And, you know, he was very good at it when a lot of people were just kind of, you know, scalping, you know, the, you know, whatever the front contract was in, say, the guilt or the footsie or whatever. He would, you know, he would make like roam a bit pit from uh, pit to pit. And like you say, be there to provide a price in pretty much any size anyone wanted. Yeah, in, in the difficult stuff. So he wasn't he wasn't content with easy. He, no, his he flourished with the difficult and knowing didn't, that he had more chances. Didn't he also? Uh, was it not on the rolls that he did quite a lot on as well? Was he one of the first people to do the, like the rolls on the spreads as well? Yeah, uh, it's a, it's a rolls and uh, all the stir spreads, you know, any any combination you wanted, any any spread strategy you wanted, he'd just make that price. And that's pre-screen, of course. That's just in, yeah. yeah. That's just looking at your ticker boards and going. Yeah, it's neg negative fifteen bid at uh, you know negative seventeen. I'd ne negative struggle 15. to I'd struggle to price that if I did have you it know, up on the screen. And, <laughs> but there's a mentality, and I, but I think there was a definite thing that his he had put his personality into what he was trading. It almost it had been an alignment. And I think yeah. products suit certain people. Definitely, definitely, it's. It is like a horses for courses kind of like mentality for a lot of people. Yeah, I think that's why like the oil market suited me because I felt more comfortable with it when I first started because of the you know the geopolitical nature and it was kind of it suited my like my interests as well. And I do believe that you know as well you need to have an interest in what you're trading to be successful. Um, and I think that's another reason why I think a lot of people aren't successful is because they don't. You know, they they don't have an interest in what it is they're trading. They, as we said before, they just see numbers, and it's like the gamification of it. And you can't treat it as a game. Do you know this is this is so important because I, 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 whenever I kind of tweet about this, it seems to get a lot of responses or likes or follow up. It's this idea that it's a journey. Trading is a learning journey that takes many many years. And and I meet an awful lot of people who are on that learning journey, but they don't realise it. And they're wondering why they're not making money. They've been doing it three, four, five, sometimes seven or eight years and have not yet made a penny. And they've never really examined what they do. They just kind of do it. And they think there's an answer out there, an easy answer. It's only when they start to look inward and say, well, listen, 
actually you're not aligned with the way you're doing it you're not aligned with the markets you're doing it um you, you're not fully understanding the nature of the job only because you, you've never really got time to understand it. you've always looked outwards at what it involves it, it, which brings us straight to like one of the most crucial aspects of trading which is journaling yeah yeah it it's like yeah like i've said before we've all well we've all said before it's that you know think of like a professional uh, like an athlete but like the the top top 0.001 percent of athletes that turn up for training early and they always stay later than everyone else like your ronaldo's and your you know your federers and whatnot they get there early they do their like almost their pre-training training you know before like so equate that to being at the at your desk you know at six o'clock in the morning if your cash market opens at eight you know what figures have i got coming out later on today uh, be prepared for everything what's happened overnight you know do do a bit of reading in the morning and then afterwards after the, the trading day's finished you should be journaling and by journaling and this is like a little gripe that i have when i tell people about journaling and i'm sure you have it as well is journaling is not writing down the number of trades you've done and your p l you know your your broker emails you a statement every night with that information on it you do not need to write it out yourself by hand or on a spreadsheet or whatever you've got that for you. your journal is to write down how you felt during the day way more importantly than anything else what errors you you know you've made what to look for next time you know what worked for you yeah you know, what went well you know did you notice anything before a figure or notice anything after a figure all these things that build up but be very you know rigorous in you know how accurate you make your journal in terms of like you know okay it should, we're not asking people to spend you know four or five hours on it cause that's ridiculous but you know in the space of half an hour after you finish trading for the day you can make so many good notes and it's stuff you go back to i like, i know a couple of people that journal for two three years and then you i'd ask them it's like well you know do you ever go back and read your journal no, that, none of them did. It's like, well, do you understand the whole point of a journal is so you can go back to it and learn like what what happened on this day? Like, you know, last non-farm payroll. What, okay, well, what happened the two previous non-farm payrolls before that? Or, you know, journaling is such an incredible tool if used well. Can I share? I just think, can I share an interesting story from my own experiences journaling? Because I, go I, for it. I, I, I was someone who. I went through periods where I journaled and I didn't journal and then I journaled again. Um, and there was one period when um, I was prop trading for a bank in, in, in London and um, I was journaling quite aggressively. And then my trading hit the wall and it went downhill and then things happened at the bank I was at. Um, some political changes happened and we had changes and I ended up being made redundant as part of this process. But it was a it was about a one year long process into that ending of the uh, the job. And my trading went downhill well before that. And after I left, quite a while later, I was looking through my things and I found my old journal. And it literally, I stopped journaling almost to the day I stopped making money. And I don't know whether it was uh, the turning my fortunes that stopped me journaling and my, you know, over focus on things. But it was just coincidental with <laughs> with me stopping making money, was me stopping journaling. So that was one story. The other story was I, years later, I moved to another bank and then another bank. And my final bank was my best trading period by long term. And I was aggressively journeying uh, throughout my time there. I mean, if you can see the, the wall behind me, um, there's a it's a big pile of my journals. They're ring binders all laying there horizontally. And I, I, I used to write down, not every day. I don't think you should make your journal a burdens, burdensome thing. No, you shouldn't that's, get that's in the not, way of your, can't, your journey, yeah. you know. But I used to do it probably on average at least two or three times a week. Some weeks I wouldn't journal. Other weeks I journal a lot if there was a lot to write down. And sometimes it might be literally one line. You know, been an idiot this week or traded really well. Yeah. You know, been a total dick. I don't know what I was thinking. Might have been a comment that I'd put. Yeah. You know, but, we've all got a few of those entries. But there would be other times where I'd have a really strong view and I'd write down my reasons for that view, how I think it's possibly going to pan out. 
how I'm going to play that view out. Okay, where my where I'd be buying into the pullback, where I'd have my stop, where I'd be looking for the market to go to, how much I'm going to put on, all that sort of thing. And then I look back years later into my journals, and I noticed that a couple of times I'd written all this down. And then I hadn't written what happened next or in the following, there was no follow up. So I thought, well, what did I do? And I looked into it and I noticed that the market panned out pretty much how I said or how I hoped it was going to pan out in my plan. But I hadn't followed it at all in the way right. that I was going to do. It was it was like I'd when it got close to my bid, I pulled my bid and thought I'll try and be clever and nick a few extra you know, 10 extra points or something. Okay. And I'll drop my stop a little bit. And then I noticed that the market got to my buy level, but never got much further. It never got to where I removed my, you never get in. I never got in. And then I followed that. I chased it up buying at a really bad level. Right. That wasn't where I was supposed to buy. Then I was stopped out of that. And, And there was this whole chop process going on. And I turned what was a great, winning opportunity where I should have made a lot of money into a losing opportunity and and then I kind of just completely there was other times where I thought well did I do this again and I looked through and I'd done something very similar but I never chased it up but the market worked out to be exactly as I planned again and then I started looking through this and I noticed I'd done this often but I was blind to it I had it was almost like I ignored it because it was yeah. too painful it was, it was, to... As soon as, you wrote, as soon as you wrote in your journal, that was it, lock it up, kind of forget what you've almost put in there. But it, it, it told me a lot about myself that I wasn't seeing and that I was blind to. And this is where it's really valuable because then you start to think, wow, if only I'd have realised this. I, actually, my calls yeah. are really good. I'm, I've got a great hit rate on calls, but my hit rate on execution is awful. And this that, is it, is- that opens up a huge window of insight and feedback. You just wouldn't get anywhere else. Yeah. And all you're doing is reading your own notes. Yeah. It's, yeah this is why it's the easiest thing to do. Yeah. You know, writing, you know, like you say, OK, like, you know, it doesn't have to be every day. Obviously, if there's nothing to write about, you don't don't feel obliged to write. Anything. And it shouldn't be a chore. You know, it should be something you want to do because it, it is the easiest way to improve your trading is to keep a record of your ideas keep a record of you know your feelings throughout the day or throughout the week or whatever it's yeah it, and it's it's free yeah it, it it's crazy like just trying to get people to understand that is like this is the easiest way for you well possibly one of the best ways for you to improve yourself as a trader and it's free to do and it will take up half an hour of your day it's just it's a bit of process good. isn't it it's a, it bit is. of, yeah. a bit of yeah a bit of part of the process and um, you know having nuggets of wisdom rather than nuggets of pain <laughs> it's yeah in my view quite important you know yeah, it helps. You learn. Uh, so that when you do reflect back all you look at is, is sort of like, almost like a positive recall of the things that really regretted really yeah. rather than to relive the pain uh for me that, that that's important um from from my aspect of journaling anyway the yeah, mugram was a lifeboat and a tripwire as well although i didn't realize it i didn't know it at the time but in the front cover i always used to put in and the first few pages, some nuggets of wisdom that I would read from time to time. I had a poem which I kept on the front cover, um, which is plastered all over my walls here as well in my office. Um, but it was always available when I was trading because it was a poem that every time I got into really difficult times, I would just read it and it would just snap me back into out of a negative mindset and back into that kind of balanced mindset that I needed. Yeah, that's important. Having having something, and that's different for all of us. But you know, you, that was what it was for you. But you know, other, others, it might be something else that snaps them back. Yeah. Um, and that snap back is, as we know in in trading, you might need to snap back several times a day. <laughs> well, yeah, this is it exactly. It's almost like you know a mental slap in the face, isn't it? It's like you know, Then you look at most traders, you know, that have been around for a while, and that, like you say, you've got like you know, you had that poem on the front of your journal, or not, but other you'll see traders they might just have a little object on their on their desk or a little uh, you know everyone's got a post-it note on their screen that you'll see so many little things that traders have like for exactly that reason just you know if they're yeah if they're having a really bad couple of hours where they're completely out of sync with the market need that mental refresh you know hit f5 on the old like on the brain waves kind of thing <laughs> no it's, it's funny I, i've i've seen people in trading i've seen somebody that was 40 years old had a, had a comfort blanket would you believe 
I don't know how old this comfort blanket was. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, <laughs> one of us blanket, I saw somebody else that had a cricket bat that when things got difficult, it'd stand up and it'd start doing these sort of cricket sort of defense, oh, yeah, like forward defense. in the trading room. I've seen somebody else with a polo stick that would suddenly get out and start blooming whack, you know, winging it around. There's some very odd folk out there. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, whatever. Did you, did you have any at all? Any comments or quotes or anything they used to keep visible? Um, I'm trying to think. I... Nothing stands out that I had specifically. I've had like, yeah, not very superstitious at all. But I was at like, I've had the same couple of like pebbles that I've had on my day, and I, maybe that's my kind of thing to snap back. So I just, you know, if I two pebbles, and if ever if it gets a bit much, I feel like I just not right with the market. Just like play with the pebbles in my hand, and yeah, and it's it's weird. It, it does have a, it has a calming effect, and also it just like you say, reboots the kind of the the brainwave, so to speak. But um, uh, everyone's got something. And I think that's that's also, it was helpful being in a room of traders, which obviously, you know, with lockdown and stuff, it's, you know, those days are gone for, the, for at least the foreseeable. But just being in a room with other traders made such a difference, especially if you were having kind of quite a rough time or whatever. Yeah, yeah you didn't feel the need to, be focused on the screens if you needed to take like five minutes you turn around you have a chat with someone and yeah a lot of, there's always someone with the same similar well same or similar problems as you have with the markets yeah but then all of a sudden seeing someone that's doing really well is you know it's a bit of a kick up the ass and you kind of think okay well you know he's focused on stuff you can bounce a few ideas around with people that's and yeah that's such i mean you get I that, sorry i've interrupted you carry on that's right. no no i was just saying i just think that's so important to be able to bounce ideas around with people um, and it's it's something that I kind of I've encouraged like quite a few people and you know people that subscribe to my um, my little morning ramble and whatnot to you know if you've got it doesn't have to be a market related question if you just you know if you're feeling down or you know you just want a bit of inspiration or whatever you know just I've got I get them emailing me or I get people like direct messaging me on Twitter and whatnot and yeah they they kind of feel like sometimes that they're taking up a bit too much of your time or whatever but. I say to them, like, to be honest, it's being able to talk to someone, it works both ways. You know, you give value to receive value. So if I can help someone out, you know, that's struggling a bit on, you know, whatever, chances are that I'll get something out of it from being able to help that person, which is for me, it's, I, I really enjoy doing it. And yeah, and that's like, that's what we used to do on the old trading, like in the trading room, you know, you, you know, you would be mates with in the room, you go for a pint if someone was, you know, struggling and, you know, you talk a few things out. And I think that's why now it's, you know, traders sitting at home on their own for yeah weeks, months, since kind of like a year like, with no interactions with other traders. Um, yeah, I think they're missing such a crucial element of the, like the whole process. You know, absolutely vital, this, this concept of social reconnectivity. Um, and if you don't have a social network or a trade social network or a chat network, or you can't find one, we'll start one. You know, I, I think... Um, exactly, you know, exactly. ...the person to make that change. What I really loved about your, your comment there, um, Ryan, was, 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 was the point about helping others. The, the, yeah. The, it's that it, you get a great sense of... Uh, reward from feeling that you've helped someone on their journey yes um yes. you've given them a piece of advice that you know isn't out there in the open it's a very particular piece of advice that can actually transform the way they work and getting a sense of achievement from yeah, that definitely. um i think that that's a very very positive from a psychological point of view a very positive thing to do um you know sharing your gratitude and uh, you know the sense of you feel good as a consequence. And I think that's important. Like like I said before, it's that whole, I'm a huge believer in that give value to receive value. And to be fair, that's, you know, that's a saying that that one of the old uh, kite broking guys used to kind of drill into me. It was like, well, he phrased slightly differently. It was like, you know, good brokers, you use them or you lose them. You know, back in you know the brokers we know and like we've all dealt with that was in the days when you know a broker would give you some added value would give you some insight give you some you know some flow data you know and in return you would give him some orders back um 
and it's it's kind of more of the you know the 20, 21st century but it's kind of more the social media kind of version of that if i can help out some you know some guys that you know and there's not questions like oh should i buy here or should i sell here that's i've got no interest in that kind of question it's you know that's not for me to say but if someone comes to me and says okay well you know i'm struggling with getting you know getting in the right frame of mind for this or i keep making this same mistake again there's there's every chance that i've also suffered from that in the past or i know people that have and and i know not the answer cuz everyone's got to find their own answer i believe but if i can just help you know nudge them in the right direction or just maybe like just tilt their head slightly and get them to look at it from a slightly different perspective and nine times out of 10 if you help someone just realign how they're looking at a problem they will find the answer themselves and you know and it's it's it is a it's a brilliant thing when you can do that and help someone especially someone in their like their you know the start of their career because you do think you know well, for me personally maybe I'm doing it for selfish reasons because I like the fact that I know I've helped someone um but yeah it's, I find it so rewarding being able to do that mm. I had a situation last night one of my neighbor's sons you know saying he wants to get in the city he wants to this wants that doesn't know what he's doing doesn't you know he's, he's at Cass Business School and they still come out where the you know, it's coming out with a view that he's still not quite sure what the city presents as an opportunity. So I had, I had a chat with him and I said, look, it's it's understanding about getting information and under, understanding the market from a golden source. And I said, you know, obviously the Alpha Mind podcast is something that he needs to listen to. But I also said that he needs to do something like the STA exams, you know, Society of Technical Analysts, because they're vital you know, to understand that a market is this moving thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, We will return to the podcast shortly. First, a quick word about our podcast sponsor. This podcast is sponsored by the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA. We are delighted to be able to promote their brilliant STA technical analysis home study course. Listeners to the Alphamon podcast interested in studying for the home study course can get an exclusive discount by visiting the Alphamon blog page where they can find a link to the home study course at the top of the page. Go to alphamonblog.blogspot.com or just Google Alphamon blog. Now back to this week's podcast. It's under. It's almost like if you're a swimmer, it's understanding the water before you go in to start swimming. You know, yeah, well, that's exactly like one of Stephen's great quotes about learning to swim by reading a book. It's like yeah. you know, yeah. you, you can't do it. <laughs> it's impossible. <laughs> Not going to happen. Or you can try, but you have a hell of a shock when you get in the pool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, well, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, it's it, it's a great analogy actually because you, you you can read as many books as possible. But you can't, none of them would teach you how to swim. And it, it comes also onto that idea of mentoring, because when you go in the water first, you learn with someone else who's just there to guide you, keep you afloat, stop you from drowning. And they're like the mentors. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then if you want to become a competitive swimmer, but then you've got to learn it properly. And that's where you do the, in a sense, the studying yeah, yeah. in a way, the, the, the yeah. hard yards, the work, the equivalent of journaling, you know, what am I doing yeah. right? And you work with coaches and other mentors and funny enough there you say like you work you then work with coaches and other mentors and I think that's something as well as like you know different people have you know is you won't get much well you you'll get something but you sticking with one mentor with, with one kind of person to help guide you has a limit to how much you can learn from that person and you know going back to kind of when we started you know when I started I had a room of 30 40 traders each one was teaching me something different you know now, so I agree with you that yeah, you having a mentor helps immeasurably. But then also, it's it's knowing when okay, well, yeah, it's it's nothing personal, but you know, you might then find that you need to move on to another mentor, or you know, say you start looking at a particular market, you know, you find someone that has an experience or expertise in that market and move, yeah, you know, and start you know trying to get some some information off of them as well. I think having like you see these people that you know obviously there's very good mentors out there and there's a lot of very bad mentors. There's some of the bad mentors that I've kind of I've seen on, on uh, social media and whatnot. It seems like they, they try and get like new traders and they kind of give them the impression that you only need me in your career, which, you know, they might give them a great starting point, but eventually you, you stop learning stuff. You, you need to be constantly evolving with the market. And you can't do that if you're relying on one person to tell you if you've been a good boy or a bad boy. It's... You made a point earlier, which kind of it, it, it kind of aligns with what you just said then. 
which is a, about, you know, a lot of people, and I'm not quite sure if I'm going to, if I'm remembering this point correctly, but you said at some point you have to learn yourself. You know, you can't get, what should I do now? Where should I buy? Where, where give me a, what, what are you doing? I want to do the same. You, you can't carry on with that. No. You mm-hmm. learn that in the early stage, but at some point you've got to create your own way of doing it, your own signals, your own, well, this is you know, it. something Thank that which you. aligns with you and who well, you are and how it, you want to work. It aligns perfectly with what Mark said about David Kite. He, you know, his whole personality fitted the way he was trading. You know, he's very calm, you know, inquisitive kind of making these spread prices. And it's something that worked extremely well for him because his, you know, his whole mindset was geared that way. His personality even was geared that way. And it's, yeah, it's the same with all trading. I can't get, so, well, you can't get someone to trade exactly like you because they're not you. It's as simple as that. It, you know, everyone has their own, you know, their own little style because of their personality. You know, whether we like it or not, you know, unless you're, unless it's an algo or not, human traders have human emotions that do relate directly into trading. And also, your your experiences are different. I mean, your first experience in the market, I often call it your baptism into the market. And that will impact you for many years and will therefore shape your trading. Now, just to give you an example of that, I started trading in October 1987 as a professional bank trader. And although I wasn't in the equity markets, what happened in the equity market shook every single market up in my first month of trading. And for many, many years, I became a bear market trader. I was always <laughs> looking for a huge sell-off in equities and always thought that was going to impact my markets, the rates markets and the FX markets in a certain way. And I was conscious of, you know, you can make money drip, drip, drip. When that happens, boom, yeah. You're in trouble if you're not on the right side. So I, I found myself looking for that all the time, which is it, great because I did really well in 1994, which actually was an equity, was not an equity bear market. We had a bond bear market and I was trading bonds. So I did brilliantly. Um, the problem with that is that most of the time, the market's not in a bear market. <laughs> most, yeah. of, And even if it is, it's not a, a, a bear market that loses 50% of its value in one day. That's only happened once in ever so many hundred years so you you find yourself locked into something which really is not very healthy i should be learning to be a bull market trader as well and to trade all conditions that that handicapped me a lot for many years so this is something that i have spoken about recently to someone else yes when we're just kind of talking about markets and whatnot people that they and there's quite a few out there now that people are kind of like permanent bear kind of trade bear market traders constantly calling the top and you know this is all you know it's a bubble and all that they're constantly looking for downside in equities does that do you not think that impacts their kind of mentality side and they're just like their emotional state that they're always looking for negative they're always looking for downside in the world economy they're always looking for you know the next bad thing to happen surely this i've just i don't know i'm probably wrong but i just get this feeling that it just seems like a such a negative mindset I'm not saying you shouldn't be aware of downside in stocks and whatnot, because obviously you need to be because we do well at the moment we're suffering from downside. But it just strikes me as these perma like these perma bears, I just don't see it's a it's a healthy mindset. But it's blinkered. Con- yeah, well it's, it's not just blinkered, but it's it's you know, it's that just negative energy just constantly going through you. I just I don't know, it's it's something that I don't feel would well, it wouldn't suit me, put it that way, which, again, comes back to what we've said. It, it, you need to do something that suits you. Well, for me in those days, it was like wearing blinkers because there was a lot of bull market opportunities. There were a lot of sideways market opportunities. There were obviously corrections that weren't bear markets that were opportunities. And, and I wasn't taking advantage of them. I was missing them because I had my blinkers on, which my blinkers was always to look for one certain type of market. Yeah. And, and the market is, it's got opportunities all the time if you can see them. But if I've got blinkers on, not allowing me to see them. Yeah, you're marrying into the, you know, yeah, I'm only the downside. And then exactly. and in the meantime, then, you know, over the next six months, the stock market rallies 50% and you sat there and you've traded water. Yeah. And you, you've just, you, you've, you've missed a lot of opportunities. So, so really, you've got to learn to become a trader, ideally in all market conditions. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, that's the holy grail, isn't it? To be able to be able to sit down and whatever the market throws at you, you know, eke out a profit. But to do that, you have to have an open mind. Yes, very much so. Mark, I see you nodding over there. Well, I'm, well, I'm guessing, absolutely. It's just all so relevant, isn't it? Um, going back to the open awareness and not getting stuck in a niche, I think, is the, uh, is the important thing. But, of course, sometimes, actually, the niches might be really important, too, as we talk yeah. about David and, and the spread side of things. Um, I always remember what... Uh, uh, I think as Richard, Richard Branson used to say about you know, building up the Virgin group, but he would always try to work in the places where other people found it difficult because he knew there were less people paying attention to those places. And thus, thus there was more opportunity in those places. One of my biggest kind of the biggest niches that I carved out, I was um, trading Henry Hub for six, eight months, um, actually maybe a little bit longer than that, that, but this was about 12 years ago and I realised that no one was trading the spreads in um, in the ICE contract. It was like a semi-OTC market, uh, much bigger tick size than everything else. And I, there, there was also a, a set fee just to have access to the market um, and convinced my then boss, Peter Green, that I'm sure you know, Mark, um, yeah. you know, to Get, grant me access obviously it comes out with trading account anyway the, the fees and whatnot but it's quite a steep fee um and it was it was the same thing no no one was looking at it there was no you know there was no matching engine for the spread prices and i was basically making the spreads uh, myself on auto spreaders and whatnot and you know it was yeah i hate to use that that horrible phrase but it was free money for about six months but unfortunately it then became the point where because so much volume was now going through through me it drew other people in obviously then the spreads tighten and whatnot but it's it's exactly the same the only reason i looked at that was because no one else was looking at it and obviously it's a lot harder to do that in this day and age because you know there's yeah untold algos out there and stuff but there there are still niches that that will work and there will always be new niches that work and it's it's being able to find those niches fit yourself inside it but also at the same time carry on looking for the next niche because no niche lasts forever. Like we know it's like no edge will last forever. It's, and that's, that's a very important lesson for, I think a lot of new traders to understand, especially if they've found a, you know, they found an edge or a niche as soon as they've started trading, you know, happy days, you know, congratulations, you're off to a flyer, but do not sit on your laurels, you know, constantly be looking for that next way. And that's when, you know, when you are making a lot of money or when you are doing really well, should I say, that's when you should be working on your self-improvement because you it then gives you the time to build up for that next period. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Ryan Paisley in quotation marks, no edge will last forever. <laughs> I wish it was wrong, but unfortunately it's bang on. <laughs> but the, the, run, the, run edge that does, the run edge that does last the era forever is the human edge. You know, if, if you are doing the right things and behaving in the right way and managing yourself, that I mean, you are your biggest edge. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And that and that ties back perfectly to journaling. This is why you should, and you know, you compound that edge by journaling. Well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we see this in sport, exactly what you describe now, where a team is on the up, they're playing well, they've got a style, they're, they're, they're beating everyone. And then everyone starts to adjust to how they play. And then that, suddenly... Yeah, that is exactly what happens. That's the perfect example. It is, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. You watch enough tapes of that team playing that way, you end up, you learn to defend against that way. And you, yeah, and then suddenly they that. don't know how to win. Yeah, then you neutralise that tactic and then they've got to find the next tactic. And it is exactly the same with trading. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the market doesn't do it in the same sort of way, but it, it 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 sees these opportunities. If you're seeing it, you're damn sure at some point somebody else is going to see it. it. Yeah. And as there's millions and millions of people doing it, eventually they'll all see it and someone will do it better with you or have better, inf better systems to do it. And slowly that gap gets arbitraged away through time. Yeah, well, it's a good example of that in the markets is, um, you, I don't, I suppose you must remember the flipper. Remember he was in like the Bund and the Bubble and the Shats. Yeah, he would come in. Basically, he was one of the first spoofers. Basically, I remember I was still in the risk room at Kite when that came out. Came out because we had uh, 
journalists from the FT, I took a call from them thinking it was David Kite was the flipper. It wasn't, but uh, <laughs> they, they were kind of trying to fish around for me, see if I knew who it was. Um, but there was a, a very good trader that I'm still quite close to. And he would he was seeing the whole trading floor screaming and shouting, throwing keyboards and mo monitors and whatnot on the floor because they were getting ironed out by the flipper. So he was like, well, hang on. We know when he's entering the market because you could people were actually saying, oh, shit, here's the flipper. But then still being ironed out by him. So all he was doing is when he would see the flipper come in, he would basically like join the flipper with the spoof. And, he, you know, he did that for getting on for a year. It was really successful in doing it. And all it was, it was the same thing. He realized, you know, why am I fighting, you know, trying to hold back the tide when we know this guy's making a lot of money, you know, adapt and play his game. And you get better than him. One, well, one of the, the examples of, of the flipper wasn't the flipper. Uh, I think it was probably the early 1990s. It was where we were, we were starting to... Um, understand uh, electronic trading you know we had the apt system and all things like that and then we had the, the deutsche Bourse platform and you could you could um go into uh, worlds that were synthetic markets they were you know, like synthetic life pricing but it wasn't right. the market and there, there was an example because i was i was part of the flow against it where suddenly there was like six thousand lots on the bun bid, and the the offer was taken, and then the, and it went sit, bid for six thousand, and this churned around for like fifteen minutes. So this huge amount of size that that came in, and the depth of the market was moving with it, and everything. And, and what happened is that uh, the reality of it was is that there was someone that uh, had plugged into the real market trading platform, <laughs> doing what they thought was dummy trading. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually part of the flow against it and with it um, during this 15 minutes. And it just showed you what scaring the market with depth could do. Yeah. Uh, on a trade that wasn't a trade, but it, you know, just the sheer weight and um, creating panic from it. And I think Flipper had very much the same, almost like market. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was like build up a bid, build up a bid, go bid, go bid. And all of a sudden, yeah, yeah, there's no bids underneath him anymore. He pulls the bid. <laughs> that that was before the level. Was that before the electronic trading, or was that when we were all? I think D DTB started to happen, didn't it? You could trade the Deutsche Terma Bourse uh, boom contract, um, and you could also access the sort of synthetic market if you were trying to get familiar with electronic trading. So it was probably five years before life, or probably longer than that, before life went from open outcry to, um, to, to to full electronic. But it was in that sort of period of time where, you know, the market was starting to gamify, if that's the right word for it, yeah. into a different type of thing. And there was the classic example of the first APT system. There was some rumour that someone picked up the mouse and spoke in it and said, buy me 50 buns or something. <laughs> <laughs> All these types of stories about just how unfamiliar we were with um, the use of that type of technology uh, at at that time. You know, the, what we've got today wasn't around then. You know, no. the internet then. Well, it's um, like Twitter. I think Twitter is such a level up for so many people because it just makes yeah, it makes the ability to talk to so many people and like so many people sharing great information for free. I do think like. If Twitter's used well, it's an absolute game changer for for all traders. Um, yeah, it is what you make it, like I say, and also give value to receive value. But yeah, I don't think there's ever been the possibility for as much for a trader to sit there and get as much high, you know, high class information as they can now. It's I think if used well, it. Well, I think you have to use it well, basically, if you want to succeed. Yeah. Ryan, I'm, I'm conscious of the time and we're, we're going to get close to wrapping up soon. This has been a great talk and I, I could talk for ages. I really could. <laughs> and one day we should do it when all this ends and we're down the pub again. Yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I, should, I want to ask you, what three wisdoms, three wonderful pieces of wisdom for our audience that, you, that I know I haven't plugged you for this, so you're going to have to think yeah, of it uh, okay. well, off, off, off the top of your head. <laughs> no edge lasts forever. It's definitely one. <laughs> No edge lasts forever. Okay. Give value to receive value. Okay. Uh, I'm a big believer in that. Um, and the third, 
keep it tight. Okay, that's a brilliant one. And three, what three things do you think people, that are generalisations that three errors people make, particularly new people who are starting out in this, who, who are, you know, they're searching around in the dark probably for things. So what, what three errors would you think they need to work hard to avoid? Um, it's not a game. Yeah. Um, oh, that is a toughie. Um, now, so repeat the question again, please. What what three errors would you, you know, from your own experiences oh, right. over time, would you think people really need to pay attention to classic errors? It's basic errors, it's the lack of journaling or poor journaling. I do. I think that is if people can sort that out and get it nailed from the very start, they are off to a flyer. And they're off to much, you know, they're in the top 10% of people trying to start trading from the off. Um, and also to, to be mindful that you automatically blinker yourself whenever you're trading. If you can, you know, if you trade FX, don't just look at the FX market. Don't just look at like the the yen dollar pair or the cable. Like understand what's moving that. Understand the economy behind that. Um, is that free? <laughs> yeah, no, it is actually. It I, is. As that last point, I think it's incredibly important because you see a lot of FX traders. They have no idea what else is going on in the world. And at the end of the yeah. day, you know, it's the economy that drives the FX price. It's you know, it's it's the central banks that drive. You need to know, you know, let you know the two, three steps behind what you're actually trading. It's. I mean, FX is a beast, and there's you know, there, there are waves you know, that are coming from lots of other areas that are leaning into that market. Yes. And we're, we're seeing one of them playing out now, I guess, with the, uh, the, the, you know, fears of inflation in the US. The US is is kind of leaning more towards that than Europe and the rest yeah. of the world and pushing rates up. And we're seeing the, the dollar strengthening, you know, over the past few weeks, whether it's a correction in its strengthening, in its weakening move of last year or whether it's a new move. It's a new strength we won't know, and but for right now it's playing out. Yeah, we're like you know the whole reflation trade is kind of it's all systems go, isn't it? You got what US ten years at the moment are trading one point six percent, whereas you got German ten years are trading at negative point three percent. It's yeah, <laughs> that that spread and, between the two. It's like... and, and you know it's a great great example of what you talked about at the very beginning of this this conversation, where you said you can know it, but the market may not have picked it up yet, because there's nothing new in that. But for some reason, the market seems to have picked it up just in the past, yeah. past sort of four, three, four weeks. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You just don't know when they're going to come into vogue. Yeah, this is it. That's that. And that's, you know, that is the, the key to success. It's kind of your timing on that front. Yeah. So, OK. So and, and also before we before we wrap up again where can you tell can you tell people a little bit about your service and where they can find out yeah. about you so it's so obviously on twitter everyone hopefully well most people most know me by now it's priapus iq um and it's uh priapus.iq.com is my website and from there uh it's the daily uh, sorry the morning ramble which is just a bit like a nice neat primer for everyone that c- c- contains the news what's happened and you know what's what to look out for for the day coming up um, I also, you know, people have access to my own uh, research folder on that, which is kind of where I get a lot of my ideas from. And soon, well, it's hopefully in the next five to six weeks, we're launching um, what's called PIQ Suites, which is, think of it as it's tweet deck, but with the ability to drag in columns for RSS feeds for different subjects like markets, FX and whatnot, um, and also economic data. And we'll have headline news as well. It's basically just a, a way for people to have as much information on one tab as possible, which I'm really excited about. So just more okay, ways brilliant. to get people uh, the information that, that, they, that they desire, really. Fantastic. And if anyone's um, wondering a little bit more about those details or, or missed it, we'll, we'll put it on our blog page. So every, every podcast has a blog page attached to it on the Alpha Mind blog. Just Google Alpha Mind blog and there'll be episode notes which go alongside this. So all those details will be on there. Okay, brilliant. Mark, any any final thoughts? Well, listen, it's been uh, a, a great chat, Ryan. 
through the risks of getting stuck in a, a bad habit and thinking that one product is only the only thing you need to focus upon and you know open your awareness look look at the broader market ask yourself have you aligned yourself to the right product for your personality because if you can, things are a lot easier yeah Absolutely. A, lot, a lot less pressure you understand it more you have that curiosity um and of course as, as you mentioned the the, the the gratitude in particular and the socializing thing with us all being so isolated is it can never be more important than it is now and, I, and I, I want to throw out a bit of a question for both of you that perhaps is not not for this pop up but something to dwell upon um that as we've sp- spoken through today it's suddenly something that came to my mind that actually we we kind of say that treating the market like a game is sort of perhaps not the best way um but we certainly know that there is some gamification going on I th- at some point the question is, is when does gamification suddenly become a relevant strategy for trading? It might not be now, but there may be a point in the future where the way that information is, is brought together, that actually gamification actually becomes a strategy. Yeah, well, well for some, is it already an edge? Yeah, and it, exactly. It, that's, it, yeah, that's a very good point. Edge for someone that's not of our mindset, but is a... You know, a twelve-year-old that's picking up on, on something that we're not seeing because we're yeah. not in that direction. Absolutely, well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It might be, you know, when the the guys from the floor, like you said, first got in front of a screen and they're picking up the mice and barking orders into it. Is, is that what we're kind of seeing now for the guys that have been on screens all their career? Yeah, exactly. are we now missing kind of these big edges that are now developing for, on the gamification side? Is well, to be fair, now you've said it, I'm now thinking it's more likely than not. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really, an interesting point. Yeah. Well, really, really it's, it, 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 you have to learn what the game is. You have to understand the game. And there's probably a lot more to the game than you first realise when you step in there. And that's kind of what you've got to do. Um, you know, if you want to grow into it, the game is always changing and evolving. Yeah. Um, it has some window. basic yeah. rules. It has some basic rules. It, it, and, and there's a million different games. You know, the guy... You know, when you're sitting at the blackjack table, you're not playing the same game as the dealer and the house. No. You've got, you're playing a great, you're meeting each other, but you're actually playing different games. Um, and, and there's a, if you go into a casino, there's there's hundreds of different games going on around you. And if trading is a bit like that. Yeah. Yeah. You sit, in a, you sit in a room full of traders, everyone's going to be doing something slightly different. Absolutely. Well, look. Again, fascinating, Ryan. And I, well, we'll, Ryan, no edge will last forever, Paisley. <laughs> it's, it's been a pleasure. Please don't prove me wrong. <laughs> um, uh, guess great. Uh, th- thanks again. Um, oh, thank you for having me. I've had a great, yeah, it's been great talking to you guys. Yeah. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's Alpha Mind podcast. If you have enjoyed this podcast or any of our past podcasts, we would be delighted if you could rate the podcast on whichever service you use or even better, leave a review. Thank you also to our podcast sponsor, the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA. You can go to technicalanalysts.com to find out more about their services and to explore becoming a member of the STA. As a reminder, at Alpha Mind, we focus on trader and investor personal growth and development. We offer coaching programs which are geared towards developing the key human personal and behavioral skills that are so vital in helping people grow their performance and take their trading or investing to a higher level. Our clients come from a range of backgrounds from across the world. These include leading portfolio managers working at some of the world's largest hedge funds, asset management firms and sovereign wealth funds. We also work with investment banks and some of the world's largest commodity and energy trading businesses. Our clients also come from a myriad of other backgrounds, including family offices, proprietary trading firms, as well as many serious private retail traders. In addition to trade and investor coaching, our services extend to executive, leadership and team coaching with a specialist focus on financial markets, investment and risk businesses. To know more about our services, visit our webpage alpha-mind.net or email us info at alpha-mind.net or visit the Alpha Mind blog page for more contact information. If you would like to sign up for our regular 
newsletter. You can do so on the page link at the top of the Alphamind blog. And you can also listen to our podcast on our new Alphamind YouTube channel. Finally, you can follow us and connect with us on social media. We are active on LinkedIn in our own names, Stephen Goldstein and Mark Randall, or through the Alphamind group on LinkedIn, which is over 15,000 members. You can also follow us on Twitter. Our handles are Alphamind101 and Alphamind102. We wish you well, stay safe and have a great week.